Okay, hi, morning everyone. Um, I've been asked to present to you this decision of um, Caldor versus <coughs> Leanne, which is one of the latest cases in um, which deals with the issue of copying of a design. Just by way of background facts, I've included in your pack um, sort of a key document which shows um, the two designs that were in issue and the degree of similarity <clears throat> between them. So just looking at the facts, uh, the, the issue here was that uh, John Caldor, <clears throat> some of you might know, is a, a fabric designer, while the defendant to this matter was, uh, was Leanne, uh, a company which makes and designs garments. And by way of brief facts, uh, leading up to these two designs, um, Leanne was briefed by Marks and Spencers um, to effectively pitch fabrics uh, to be used in one of uh, Marks and Spencer's clothing collections. It was called Per Una. Some of you might remember that. It was a, um, it translates, I think, into For Her, and it's, it's from Italian to English. Um, and for this purpose, John Caldor had supplied, the claimants had supplied some fabrics to Leanne, and the issue was that Leanne, the designer at Leanne, had seen um, the, the apparently had seen this design, had considered it, uh, and then um, the pitch was made to Marks and Spencers. It was successful, but ultimately the John Caldor fabric, um, which is the one in Annex 1 of the, fir the first picture you can see, was not used um, for the purposes of the Marks and Spencers collection. But once this uh, collection, uh, this Peruna collection, uh, came out, um, effectively all hell broke loose because um, uh, it transpired that one of the dresses in the Marks and Spencers collection had a, what well, as you can see, I think a pretty similar tribal print uh, design. It's not, it's not exactly the same, but um, <coughs> certainly on an objective level, it looks um, quite similar. It's a bit like the, if you saw the Joseph bag, if you simply removed a few of those features, it would look roughly the same. Um, and the question really for the judge was whether or not um, that was enough. So I'm just going to, the, the, they have the two prints and um, the question for the court, um, which looked at how to determine these sorts of cases, the question for the court was whether or not um, this, uh, these similarities were enough in and of themselves to establish um, copying. Um, and of course different opinions could be taken as to whether or not they are similar and how similar they are but I think the general consensus in the fashion industry afterwards was that they were pretty much identical. Uh, so the question is what's the, uh, what's the law on this which is quite interesting and I've set out um, in summary fashion, obviously it's a bit more complicated than that, but in summary fashion the law is contained, the cru well, at least the crux of the law is contained in section 16 of the <coughs> Copyright Designs and Patents Act, and effectively, and this is just a summary, um, the claimant uh, has to establish that the alleged in infringing article was copied directly or indirectly from the copyright work, and that the act of copying was done in relation to the work as a whole or any substantial part of it. But effectively, what does that mean? And this was previously considered um, in uh, the courts in a case called Stud Art International and Lomas Carpets Limited, which established that um, usually um, this is uh, proven, or at least the, the copying, uh, whether or not something was copied, was, is established effectively by way of inference. Uh, that you, it's quite rare, I think, for someone to be able to um, go off and provide direct evidence of copying. Um, designers don't have, as the judge put it, spies at their side. So it's, it's quite rare for someone to say, well, here you go, there's a document and it proves that this was copied, or usually it's proven by way of inferences, and those inferences are drawn from what are objective similarities. So you'd think that in a case like this, there are quite a few objective uh, similarities. In a, if you look at those two designs, they are objectively, I think, quite similar. But the question was, for the judge in this case, in Caldor versus Leanne, is that right? Is it fair to say, well, simply on the basis of objective similarities, we find that there's a copy. Perhaps that would be a little bit too simplistic. Um, so the onus 
following Stoddart, the onus, as I've put on the slide, the onus really shifted to the to a defendant to an action to satisfactorily explain the similarity, but the difficulty that the judge had in Caldor was that effectively that could lead to the conclusion that every time there are objective similarities and every time someone cannot say, well, I didn't can't prove they didn't copy the design, then effectively that would mean that um, the judges almost always find that, um, they, that, that there was um, infringing copying going on. So in this case, the judge uh, went a little bit further and um, found that the defendant shouldn't really have what he described as a mountain to climb following, um, if there is an allegation of copying, that um, effectively some onus should shift to the claimant to try to uh, demonstrate this, this uh, copying is going on. And um, the judge acknowledged in this case that, um, of course, for the purposes of Section 16, any direct evidence of copying will be rare. He, uh, Judge Hakon, had um, acknowledged that copying is to be proven by way of inference, but he went a bit further and established what can be described, these are sort of my words, but they can be described as a sort of sliding scale. Uh, the, the, the crux of the matter being that the stronger the evidence of copying there is, the more compelling the, defend the evidence from a defendant must be. So the defendant to an action here, Leanne, had to effectively give quite compelling evidence as to what uh, the defendant did in terms of the defendant's design being its own design. But that is not a mountain to climb. It can't be impossible to prove that. It's if the defendant's evidence, for example, is quite compelling and quite and not not open significantly to challenge, then of course the defendant may be able to point to the fact that the design was its own. And there are various aspects of the sliding scale. So, for example, whether the the judge will look at issues such as, for example, whether or not the um, design itself is commonplace. So I mean, you might think that, for example, the, the Joseph bags you saw are sort of quite commonplace, or you know, the McDonald's golden arches are sort of commonplace uh, designs. And um, if it's commonplace, the judge will also look at the scale um, following Caldor um, within the commonplace nature of the design. So they'll look at issues pertaining to that. Uh, I'm just trying to find the right um, wording. So the judge, for example, found that similarities which are shown to be commonplace give rise to little or no inference of copying. The nearer a similarity approaches to the strikingly original end of the spe spectrum, the greater weight it carries in supporting an inference of copying. So it's all kind of to do with these inferences on a sliding scale. You might find think that it's a sort of common sense decision. Um, so what are the principles emerging out of Caldor? I've put, a, I've put them up here. Um, in, in some ways, there is, a, there is still a burden on the defendants to um, demonstrate what the defendant did. But there is now, I would suggest, uh, a more rigorous um, burden uh, on the claimant. To a, to a, I, I would say it's a more rigorous burden than with that that was established in prior case law, um, which effectively gave the, the claimant carte blanche in a situation, especially like the one pertaining to Caldor, where um, the two designs were very similar. <clears throat> And in this case, uh, the, the overall uh, result was that the claimant's evidence of copying was not compelling enough to give Justice Hakon effectively reason to disbelieve what he found was coherent evidence given by the defendant's principal witness, who was the designer. So the designer had actually come up with um, effectively a coherent account of her own design, and that is what perhaps some people find shocking, the fact that she'd accepted in her evidence that um, she'd seen the design of John Caldor and considered it 
and despite that, um, there was no, there was, wasn't sufficient evidence of actual, um, or indeed subconscious copying. It wasn't, um, it wasn't enough. Um, there wasn't enough evidence of that. So perhaps by way of practicality, um, what I would suggest, what lessons I would suggest could be drawn from this decision. Um, now, I, I would suggest it's important to maintain records, an audit trail, and I've put here importance of the initial design brief. The judge, if you read the judgment, um, had looked uh, very carefully at the brief that was given to the designer by Marks and Spencers and how that corresponded with what um, the designer in her evidence suggested had received from, from John Caldor. Um, so an audit trail now um, is particularly important um, when there is any risk whatsoever of a design being copied because otherwise you may end up in court and um, uh, simply without enough evidence to discharge the slightly greater burden on the claimant following this decision. Um, so just again, um, what's the significance of Caldor um, versus Leanne? Well, I think primarily um, mere objective similarities are not sufficient. I think it, it can be suggested that they used to be sufficient. So even if uh, two designs are considered and there is an objective similarity uh, or objective similarities, um, that's not sufficient. Um, I would suggest uh, that it, there is a sliding scale now in respect of um, proving an allegation of copying. It really is a matter of um, ultimately um, common sense, looking at um, the degree of copying or the degree of similarity there is, and obviously, uh, I think probably fairly, if the degree of similarity is particularly um, great, then that uh, establishes a greater burden on the defence to um, the defendant to an action, uh, to an allegation of copying, to discharge. Uh, and of course, as I've already said, um, the importance now is greater uh, of maintaining coherent evidence of the design process if there is any possibility that the design might be copied. Uh, the decision itself provides, um, or at least provides a summary of um, what the law in relation to copying is. It's quite useful in that respect, but I effectively I've summarised the position as it is um, now. Um, this particular decision didn't look at the further question of uh, whether or not um, there was the, the, the matter that the the um, design was copied substantially. Um, that is something that uh, wasn't an issue here because, of course, the judge refused it on the first ground. So the judge didn't consider that. But that's, of course, the other issue that has to be proven. Um, at the second stage of section 16. Um, as to whether or not uh, a substantial or whole part of the design has been copied or not. Even if you show that there has been copying, if it's only slight copying or if it's only partial copying, then um, it may still not fall foul of Section 16. Uh, so really that, that's, uh, that's what I have to say about, uh, about um, this particular decision, uh, which I think is uh, quite a significant move forward in terms of what the law is. I think there's already a question. Do we know whether when Caldor submitted the design to the end, has it been used on any other products? Or has it been new design? I think it was it, it was a new design, yes. If it was a new design, could they have improved their position by disclosing it under a uh, confidentiality agreement? Probably, yes. I mean those are those are matters that are I think important now give following this decision, yes. I was interested because um, I, I didn't actually find think that they were actually similar designs. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, that's a silly wiki to try and fight that. But um, it was interesting how you, you were focusing on copyright. Obviously, that was the decision. But I would have thought that would have been unregistered design right, presumably that they didn't have a registered design. Yeah. Of course, um, uh, so obviously, because it would be industrially produced, section 51, 52 of the Act would have kicked in, and this would have actually been an unregistered design rights issue, which I know is tantamount to copyright. So the court of Hakon dealt with copyright. Yeah. So it was, was it line drawings, or was it actually the designs themselves used on garments? Uh, I think it was the 
possibly the design, design drawings actually, possibly, of yes, that. Yes, so yes, it was copyright. They, they looked at that, yes. Yeah, because yes. I, I thought it was, because um, obviously they probably would have been in a situation, I had a, 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 a clothing pattern on my desk uh, it, not too long ago, and uh, it was a case of we actually were able to get a, a registered community design for that within a priority period. Uh, that did help us out considerably because, again, like with trademarks, if you have a registered design, <laughs> that's mine. I don't have to prove copying. I just have to show that it's similar. They would fail on that because I don't think they're similar. But I thought it was interesting how you focus on copyright, not on registered design. That's right, yes. Thank you. Well, I'm not actually designers or are just manufacturers of the fabric? Mm. I think they're designers. Uh, I'm not sure what the position is on manufacturing. It's not a sour grape, so they probably just didn't get the order from mm -hmm. the end of the product. Yes, that's um, probably the yeah. There's another line thing here, which is that the designers of these fabrics tend to actually end up selling the designs outright to manufacturers, because manufacturers won't go wrong. Yes, I'm just not all. Probably not. I'm reflect more on the concept of sliding scale. I'm from the US, so I have no idea about this concept. Yeah, so, that, so th th those are words that I, I sort of used to, that, that was sort of my interpretation of, of, of that. But um, what I was referring to, I think, when I said that, was that the, the judge effectively established a sort of range within which an inference can be drawn. So um, if you have two designs that, as the gentleman pointed out, may or may not, depending on interpretation, be objectively similar, um, if they are a bit similar, for example, so if they're, you know, um, somewhat similar, then the um, ultimately it, it seems to be the case that following this judgment, um, the burden on the claimant is greater, whereas the burden on the defendant is lesser. Um, because if they're, if the evidence of copying is object, on an objective basis not very strong, then of course that, that shifts the position between the claimant and the defendant. But there may be situations where two designs are objectively very similar, more similar than these ones. So for example, I don't know, um, as, as I pointed out, the, the, the Joseph bag with just slightly differing lines, you know, in terms of the actual um, measurements of the lines or something like that where quite clearly the, the designs are very similar for example then of course uh, the burden on the defendants will be greater and ultimately in a, in a case like this it will turn on the evidence that's given but as I said the burden will be greater on the defendant in those cases to demonstrate its own design process and how it reached that particular design so that's sort of what I mean I, I try to find a way in which to summarise that, really. But that's my summary. It may not, may not be a good one. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much, Alexander. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.